Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It is a privilege and joy to be here. I actually do believe that this is the third or fourth time I've been here, which makes this the congregation that I have preached at the most in this area, uh, other than my own. So uh, it is good to gather together, and I am very happy to support my, my friend and brother in Christ, uh, Pastor Mize. Uh, the reading that I am going to be preaching upon is uh, Psalm 51, a portion of it. I'd like to read that. This is, of course, King David after he was confronted with his sinful uh, behavior, and he is brought to repentance by the work of God's Holy Spirit. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb and taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Well, one of the reasons that I chose Psalm 51 is that um, I had uh, an unexpectedly busy week this week. <laughs> I, of course, had spoken with Pastor Mize um, some time ago and little did I realize that uh, um, I would be spending the entire week at Camp Linhaven for Servant Week because, unfortunately, um, our chaperones uh, became unavailable due to sickness. And so I uh, got the suggested readings and I thought, boy, that shrewd manager, that's a hard one to preach on. But I had been speaking with the youth all week long in our little church devotions about the importance of prayer and that there are two people to pray for. To pray for others and to pray for yourself. And one of the stories that I told them is that I, I once ran into a guy, I was talking with him, uh, not a Christian, um, a, a, a person following the Jewish faith, and so he understands about prayer uh, to some degree. What he didn't understand is the importance of praying for yourself. And I should have reminded him of King David here because one of the things that startled me in my conversation with him is he said, oh, I pray for other people all the time. Huh, that's nice. And then he said, but I never, I never would pray for myself. And his thinking was that that was too selfish, that was too self-centered. I countered that by saying, I pray for myself all the time because I need it. I need God's strength. I need God's help. I talked with him about how I pray for the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And sure, that's nice to pray that for somebody else, but I need that myself. Again, what I should have talked with him about is the importance of the prayer of confession. Because you don't confess somebody else's sins. You confess your own sins. And so I, I drilled this into the kid's head all, all week long this last week. The importance of confession. The importance of praying for yourself. So, Today we're going to focus upon the work of God. You've just heard Psalm 51. We're going to see how God was at work in David's life, what that means to us. 
The thing I will start out by saying when it comes to sin is that I think that there is a big misunderstanding, has been for quite a while, um, about sin. In fact, a book was written back in the 60s um, by a theologian, and the question on the cover of the book was, whatever happened to sin? In other words, everybody's just doing whatever feels good, and nobody realizes that there's consequences. Well, you know what, that may have been a problem in the 60s, but it was also a problem in the 20s. It's a problem in the 2020s. Um, it's always been a problem. Because people think that sin is superficial. They think it's just skin deep. It's maybe the things that you do. And so there is this real temptation when you hear about uh, how broken David became in his relationship with God, in his relationship with other, with his behavior with Bathsheba and, of course, Uriah, it's easy to think, well, I mean, I've never committed adultery and I've never had somebody murdered, so maybe I'm not such a sinner. That is a temptation for us to ask God to help us avoid. So I'd like to say this. It's easier to sin than really any of us recognize. That's one of the fun things about working with youth is that they will say things without any filter. And um, one time, many, many years ago, I was talking with this, this girl who was new to our youth group, um, didn't come from a Christian background, but she was, you know, interested in the fellowship. And of course, we would always do some Bible study. And we were talking about how sin is serious. And I asked the, the question, that might be interesting what comes to your mind first, is it possible, is there any scenario where you could go an entire day without sinning? And you know, some people think, well, you know, if I was like in a padded room or something where <laughs> there's like no visual stimulus, maybe I could, you know, go a day without sinning. And then so this girl said, Oh yeah, yeah, I could go a day without sinning, no problem. So I asked her, well, what is your definition of sin? Well, that, that made her think. So, you know, high school student, who knows exactly what she'd been involved in, but she started thinking about it, she's like, well, I mean, a sin would be like if you went to a party that your parents told you not to go to and maybe had some stuff to drink that you weren't supposed to drink and maybe did some things you weren't supposed to do. And then all of a sudden I think she started to get a little convicted. So then she gave herself this escape clause and she says, but not like the first time you did that, you know, only if you did it after you knew it was wrong. And, you know, I, I I had a nice conversation with her and she was surprised to hear that I sin every day. She's like, you do? Really? Because she was thinking about just a few little categories of things and not just the first time, the second time you did it. And when I said, you mean you can do anything once and get away with it, like even murdering somebody, she started to realize the fallacy of her thinking. The good news about her is that she stayed engaged with youth group and the word and came to faith and was later baptized because she recognized that she too sins every day. See, it's not just our thoughts and our words and our actions or our inactions. Sin permeates us through and through. It's our very nature to be corrupted by sin since the fall in the garden. In fact, we're born broken. We are born corrupted by sin. So we need help. We need a savior. So that's what I want to talk about today because we have help and we have a savior. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we gather, we thank you that you have come to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Lord, help us not to focus on how broken other people are, 
Help us to see your work for us upon the cross as received by us also today in this holy sacrament. We thank you, Jesus, for being our Savior. Amen. 1 John 1 says, If we say we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. This is incredibly serious. To, to make God a liar by saying, oh no, I don't sin. Uh, you know, again, I'm trying not to be judgmental of others, but boy, when people can't admit that they did anything wrong, it really makes me wonder about their understanding of scripture, because it's pretty clear. If we say we've not sinned, we make God out to be a liar, and even more significantly, the word, his word, is not in us. Now, you know the Gospel of John, I'm sure. And you know that the Word is really Jesus. And so if we go around, again, really easy to see other people's sin, but not able to identify our own brokenness, our own corruption by sin, then what that means is this. Jesus, the Word that became flesh, Jesus is not in us. A few verses later, or earlier I should say, in 1 John 1, 8, we hear that if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. There again, it's bad enough to be deceived and to be living a lie, but who or what is the truth? Well, you know, again, from the words of Jesus there in John 14, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So when we hold on to unrepentant sin, acting like it never happened, acting as though we got away with it maybe, or there was no big deal, then we have a problem. The Word, the Savior Jesus, is not in us. The truth, the Savior Jesus, is not in us. And without Jesus, sin and brokenness and separation remains. Without Jesus, there's no way to life and salvation without Jesus. So this brings us back to King David and the brokenness that he was experiencing. Now you might be thinking, well, you know, King David was Old Testament. He didn't know about Jesus, but his hope was in the promises of the Lord. That there would be the one that would come. That there would be a Savior, a Messiah. That all people would be blessed through the offspring of Abraham. Because David had been living with unrepented sin, he was stuck. Stuck with that sin, stuck in that sin, and he knows it. And he'd been, you know, maybe living in denial, but he knew it deep down in his heart. He says, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Why, that is a burden to bear. That burden of sin and guilt and shame. And that is a weight that is too heavy for anyone to carry. It's a weight that's too heavy for us. But it is also a weight that we cannot crawl out from underneath. We can't get rid of that weight, that burden of brokenness ourselves. So God's word reveals this truth about ourselves and this truth about God. That we are not God and we need God to bring healing and wholeness to us. Dealing with sin requires more than merely trying to clean up your act. God wants a change of heart. And we might want that too, but we cannot change our own heart. You know, listen to um, Ephesians, where it says in the second chapter, that we are dead in our trespasses and sin. Again, not only do people not realize how much we sin, they also don't realize how serious sin is. It is absolutely 
deadly. So to illustrate how deadly sin is and how uh, we cannot, you know, rescue ourselves, let's just think about that word dead. I hope this really does not become an actual sermon illustration, but if I were to fall over with a sudden massive heart attack, I mean, that'd be good because I'd get to go be with Jesus, but I'd have a problem in that I couldn't somehow help myself. I, I couldn't somehow, you know, resuscitate myself. Even if my brain waves were still functioning as I lay on the ground down there, no matter how hard I tried, no matter how hard my brain was saying, get up, I couldn't. We desperately need someone to do CPR or get one of those, you know, uh, defibrillator machines or something like that. I couldn't do it myself. So, so it is with each of us because of sin. We are spiritually dead apart from Jesus Christ and can do absolutely nothing to fix that situation. There is no technology, there is no technique that can help us. There is only one who can help us, and that is God himself. That's what makes Jesus, the very Son of God, that's what makes him the Savior. That's what allows him to make these audacious claims that he is the only way to the Father. Because he is the only one sent from the Father, the only one to become one of us, to take on human flesh as God himself. The only one to go to the cross, holy and innocent. The one who knew no sin, who became sin for us to bear the burden of our sins, not his own sin, to be a sin offering, to perfectly obey his own commands, to live a life with no reproach, no regret, but also the only one who had the authority to lay down his life, but also the authority to take it back up again without our help, without our assistance be raised to life because he's God himself. Each day we need this Jesus to rescue us from our sin. You could also say to rescue us from ourselves, our own flesh. That is David's prayer in Psalm 51. His prayer is a confession of sin. It's an acknowledgement of it. But here's the thing I like to say, you know, think about that word confess. We just confessed our faith. So when we confess our sin, we are saying the same as God. And so a confession of sin is also a, a confession and expression of our faith. We are saying, God, I need your help. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. That's his confidence. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. This is the truth that God reveals to us. He has come to rescue us from sin. This truth that God in his grace, through faith in him, takes our sin away. This is the work of Jesus. We've already talked about the cross. We can't talk about it enough because in 1 John 1, 7 it says, it's the blood of Jesus, his son, that cleanses us from all sin, who takes away our unrighteousness because he is the faithful one and he has given us this promise. So our salvation has been accomplished. It is a gift to be received again today as we come to him. It is a process that God gives to us of healing us from our own selves, the old Adam within us. So St. Paul says, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed 
day by day. Now, one of the great fears that I had this morning was that I would show up at the wrong time. And so I went to your website and um, right there, front page, join us at 1030. I'm like, okay, okay, not 11, <laughs> don't show up late. And then I, I read a little bit more and there's this marvelous statement there on the front page of your website. It, it, it asks this question, what makes Lutheran liturgical divine service different? In the divine service, God is the one serving mankind. That may seem opposite from what you have heard. Shouldn't we be serving him? Well, yes and no. In the divine service, Christ serves us his forgiveness and faith through his word and sacraments. Then we are fed to go and serve our neighbor. To serve your neighbor is to serve God. So I love that explanation. I'm sure you've heard that plenty of times before, if I know Pastor Mize. Um, but it was uh, refreshing for me to be reminded of this. This is why we continue to pray, why we continue to study God's word, why we continue to worship. <laughs> to not give up the habit of gathering together as some have done, you know, as it says in scripture. To receive the Holy Sacrament, to remember the cleansing power of our baptism, the working of God in our life. So God is at work. He's at work to bless us in relationship with him. And that's why David cries out, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence. You know, that's the division caused by sin. That's the consequence, to be separated. Well, with healing, we're not cast out of God's presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me, but be renewed by that Spirit. David asked for God to keep working, which of course he does. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. This is asking for more than God's assistance. Again, if I'm laying on the ground, I don't get myself back up. This is professing dependence upon our God. Dependence upon Him to raise us from the dead, to give us new life, to strengthen and protect us all the way to the full expression of that new life in heaven. The work of God in our heart then has a spillover effect. Uh, that's what Pastor Mize or whoever wrote that was speaking of. You know, we are um, fed to go and serve our neighbor. Well, the way that King David put it is this. Then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners will return to you. O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. So David, it began with hidden, unrepentant sin. It's a burden. It's, his bones are wasting away. I think that's Psalm 32. Um, and he ends with God using his testimony as a teaching tool that will lead others to faith and salvation. The Lord opened David's heart, took away the sin. And it is not a coincidence that we are still speaking of this work that God did 3,000 years ago with David or the work that God did 2,000 years ago with the coming of Jesus Christ. God is still doing this same work of drawing people into relationship with him. And part of that is the confession of our sin. Because it's sin that breaks us. It's sin that separates us. And if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the story of God's work it's not just about someone a long time ago. We too declare God's praise for forgiveness and salvation. So thanks be to the Father who loves us, to the Son who paid the price for our sin to forgive us, the Holy Spirit 
restores us also today. Thanks be to God. Amen.